to worship this Sunday morning. It's good to see you here as we gather together for worship. I have a couple of announcements for you. First, St. Mark's will be serving at Loaves and Fishes on June 10th from 3.30 to 6.30, including preparing, packing, distributing, and cleaning up with our bi-monthly commitment. If you are able to be able to be there um, and lend a hand, please contact Jeff either uh, today or uh, give him a call or text or email reach out to him if you're able to volunteer that is June 10th which is two Mondays from this coming Monday is that two Mondays from now my goodness um, also next Sunday after worship there will be a congregational meeting following worship there will not be a vote but there are important updates to the legacy process with information to share so please plan on attending that there will be handouts so we'll talk about it as well as provide material so that you can read it the anticipation we anticipate that we will actually gather again on June 23rd to vote about different issues but the second Sunday, June 2nd, this next Sunday, is information so that you have time to process it and ask questions. Those are the only announcements I have. Are there any other announcements for the life of the church? If not, then I invite you to take a breath in and a breath out to let go of whatever may have already held for you this morning as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this day. I invite you to join in the call to worship. Faded photographs, distant memories of special times, of painful news, family and friends saddened by death, anguished by loss, conflicted over wars. Yet we are not alone. We are surrounded by the saints and forever remembered by God, forever held by God forever given reason to sing, for God's love is stronger than death, and the Spirit gives wings to new hope. Let us join our voices in the opening hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Can you turn it up a little bit, Jeff? Thank you.
Jeff. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy God, we give thanks for the gift of life and breath, the gift of gathering this day. Open our hearts and minds to what you would say to us as we hear your word, as we lift our prayers and praise to you. Strengthen and nurture us and send us out to be a people of hope, a people of love. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and one another in the prayer of confession. Creating God, in love you moved over the waters of chaos and separated sea from dry land. And yet we cling tightly to rigid boundaries of our own making. You claim us in the waters of baptism and declare us dead to sin and alive in Christ. But too often we deny that call conforming ourselves to the whims of culture. At Pentecost, you released your wild and transforming spirit to flow through church and world, but we want to tame that wildness, channeling your spirit through banks of ordered safety. Transform us, we pray. Soften the unyielding edges of our hearts. Loosen our grip on the way it's always been and prepare us for the joy of the way it still can be through Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to a moment of silent confession. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. Jesus Christ's power is unequaled. His grace is unrestrained. His strength is steadfast. And his embrace is sufficient to carry all that we are and hope to be. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As brothers and sisters who share Christ's love, let us exchange signs of peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace.
Scripture reading for this day comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 15, verses 1 through 26 and 51 through 57. Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, in which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Lastly of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he, did not, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have died in Christ have perished. For if this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of God to Father, God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This ends today's reading. I no longer get the actual newspaper anymore. Does anyone else, does anyone get the actual newspaper still? One? 
two people, right? I only get the electronic version because I would get the paper and then it would pile up and I'd feel guilty because I never got to it and so I finally just let it go. But when I was growing up and even until probably about six, seven years ago, I always got the paper and I always looked forward to particularly, especially growing up, the Sunday comics because they were in color, right? That and of course the advertisements. Calvin and Hobbes was always my favorite, it still is, but I'd read Sally Forth, sometimes The Far Side, and almost always The Family Circus. Yes. I remember Jean would often bring me clippings from the either weekday paper or the Sunday comic section of things that he thought I would particularly like, usually related to church. William Aloysius Bill Keene was the creator of Family Circus, and it ran from 1960 still to today. Bill died in November of 2011, but his son Jeff has continued on the comic strip. And the ideas for that strip came from Bill's own family and life and children, and now it comes from his grandchildren and probably great-grandchildren. He touched a lot on family life, but also on faith and he was both widely criticized as well as praised for doing so. He said, I never set out to be an evangelist. All I'm doing is showing the way that faith touches a child's life or family life. Dolly asks her mom, is God white, black, brown, yellow, or red? And mom says, yes. Or Billy opens the church door and yells, are you home, God? Coming out of Sunday school, one of the kids tells his mother, we learned the fourth commandment, humor thy father and mother. <laughs> and the last one, Dolly was sitting in church and said to her mom, how much longer till we goeth home? <laughs> I could go on and on, but I remember what I remember most about the family circus is that Bill Keen would often portray the grandpa who had died sitting up in a cloud in a white robe, looking down upon the family, watching them tenderly and lovingly. You know what I'm talking about? When I was little, I used to imagine my grandparents looking down at me, watching me grow up. And still yet today, I like to imagine all those I have loved and lost, gathered up in the clouds in heaven, singing and praising God and waiting to welcome me and you home. The family circus influenced how much, influenced how I imagine heaven to be, as much as, or perhaps even more so, than the scriptures. Because none of us have actually seen heaven. So many have written books, or painted paintings, or written poems, or drawn comics, trying to imagine something of a mystery. What is heaven? What does it look like? Paul in his letter to the church in Corinth is talking not so much about heaven, but rather resurrection and bodily resurrection, which made me think of the grandfather in the family circus. In the beginning of Paul's letter, you might remember Paul focused on the importance of the cross, and in the 15th chapter, almost near the end of that letter, he focuses on resurrection. The cross and resurrection, you cannot have one without the other. So he begins by reminding the Corinthians of what they have already heard, the good news proclaimed by Paul himself. He says, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received. Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. And then Jesus appeared first to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the twelve, and then some 500 brothers and sisters, and then to James. Did you notice who was missing? Who did the Gospels, what did the say Jesus appeared to right after the resurrection? Yeah. The, women. the women. He appeared to the women, right. It's hard to say why Paul did not name them, but he didn't. So what can you do? If last but not least, Paul says, Christ appeared to him. He was last and considered least, at least in his own mind, because Paul was the one who persecuted those early followers of the way. 
That is until he walked on that road to Damascus and Christ appeared. If God can work through Paul, God can work through anyone. Regardless of whether it was the apostles or Paul or the 500, the proclamation is the same. Jesus rose from the dead, and because of that, you came to believe. We told you, you believed. So what's the problem? What is bugging Paul that he goes through this whole long verse section about this? What's bugging Paul is this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection? If there's no resurrection of the dead, and you have to follow Paul's logic here, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised from the dead. And if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then all that we proclaim to you is useless, and so is your faith. But, and this is a big but, and every time I use the word but, I think of you, Gail. So I use it very, not in that sense, but in that it negates everything that has been said when you use that little three little word. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Remember all those he appeared to, Peter and the disciples? Remember how Jesus walked on the road to Emmaus? And when evening came, he broke bread with those disciples and their eyes were opened and they realized whom it was they were walking with the whole time. Remember how Jesus appeared to Thomas and invited Thomas to put his hands in Jesus' side and to feel the nail marks for where he was nailed to the cross. Remember how Jesus appeared to the women that first Easter morning and they mistook him for the gardener. Remember how he even appeared to Paul and his eyes were blinded from the light for three days. Jesus appeared after his resurrection in his body. He ate and drank. He wasn't just a spirit. And a whole lot of people saw it and believed it and proclaimed it. Paul is saying to the church, you haven't seen it, but you have to believe the witness of those who did. You're just going to have to trust that what we are telling you is true because we experienced it. 2,000 years later, the same is true for us. We have to trust in the witness of those who came before us and actually experienced the risen Christ. We take it on faith, not sight. And in some ways, it is a big ask. There were and still are different understandings of resurrection. Some thought that it had already happened. Some were doubting it. Completely. I mean, it's a nice story and all, but it, it didn't really happen. Some thought that it was only the spirit that was raised from death to life, not so much the body. When the body dies, the soul separates from the body and lives on eternally. Body less Lee, as one of my favorite Bible commentators noted. Many today tend to believe, much like some of the Corinthians believed, they believe in the spirit part, but are not so sure about the actual body part. I'm not so sure I want this body. Maybe I want someone else's body. What about those bodies that are ravaged by disease or missing parts? What about those bodies who are lost in fires or floods or warfare? The idea of bodily resurrection, in part, led to the resistance of many religious folks to the idea of cremation. If one was cremated and no longer had a body, what would happen? Throughout history, some religions have prohibited cremation and still do today. And traditionally, even Catholics were opposed, opposed to cremation, or they at least strongly uh, discouraged it. But today, many traditions support cremation. And according to the Cremation Association of America in 2022, so just two years ago, 59% chose cremation over traditional casket burial. And by 2027, it's projected to reach over 65%. Most of what happens here in memorial services are just that, memorial services. There's many good reasons to choose cremation, cost, 
environmental concerns, logistics and getting the family all pulled together, families that are scattered all over the nation in time for a burial. Paul, of course, doesn't worry about things like that. He goes on to say, listen, I'm going to tell you a mystery. Our imperfect bodies, our perishable bodies, our mortal bodies will all be changed and death will lose its sting. Because Christ was risen from the dead, so too shall we. But it's a bit of a mystery. I can't help but hear Handel's Messiah when I read this last section. So often that oratorio is performed at Christmas time. But really, the oratorio Handel's Messiah tells the whole story of Christ, from Isaiah's prophecy of salvation, Christ's birth and passion and resurrection, the promise of eternal life, the day of judgment, and the final acclamation of Christ, finished, of course, by the Amen chorus. The words from Handel's Messiah come from the scriptures drawn over 14 books of the Bible, Isaiah and the Psalms, Matthew, Luke, and John, Revelation, Romans, Malachi, Haggai, Job, Zechariah, Hebrews, Lamentations, and lastly, but certainly not least, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, some of which were read this morning. Near the end of that over two-hour performance comes one of the very best solos. It's always sung by a bass, and it is very dramatic. And the soloist sings the words, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. And then the trumpet begins to play. And everyone kind of holds their breath, wondering how the trumpet is going to sound because the trumpet comes in cold. It hasn't been playing all along. There's a duet between the soloist and the trumpet and it is in a powerful moment. I don't really know what heaven looks like. I, like Bill Keen, like to imagine what it will be, but no one really knows. What I do know is that we are embodied people. Bodies are important. We experience the world through our bodies, but we are more than just bodies. God blew God's spirit into our bodies and gives us life. Our bodies are important, but even more so, the Holy Spirit that gives us breath makes us who we are. Maybe I'm more like the Corinthians than I first believed. Whether resurrection or heaven, whatever resurrection or heaven looks like, I trust in Paul's proclamation, though, that because Christ was raised from the dead, so too shall we. Death has lost its sting. That doesn't mean it's not painful for those of us who have lost loved ones. But it has lost its sting because we and those whom we love live on in the presence of Christ now and forevermore. And therefore, we do not need to mourn as those with no hope. Maybe we even sit on the clouds with all those we love and watch over our loved ones still here. Whatever it is, whatever it looks like, we trust that it is good because God is good. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have been richly blessed so that we might be a blessing to others. Let us share from our abundance our gifts of time, money, prayers, and energy. You're invited to give to the mission and ministry of this church and the wider church by donating either directly to the church, by placing an offering in the offering plates located at the back of the sanctuary, or using PayPal on our website. We thank you for your generosity. We'll continue this morning with an opportunity to share any joys or concerns as the body of Christ. Are there any particular joys and concerns people would like to share this day? I have, oh, Jeff. I have three joys. I had a wonderful trip out west to the Grand Canyon. Saw a beautiful country that we live in, uh, family and friends. 
Then we returned for a few days and we took another trip. This is my second joy. And that was north to our little town where my wife came from. And while it was partially a sad uh, event, we went for a funeral. We also went for a birthday. And so there again we saw many family and friends and celebrated the good news that there's a hereafter. Uh, and my third joy is that I'm back with my church family and friends at St. Mark's. Welcome back. We're glad you're here. I have some joys or some concerns to share with you as well. First of all, um, Betty Porter's memorial service is this Wednesday. It is at St. Paul's United Church of Christ on Summit Avenue. Service is at 11 o'clock. Visitation is an hour of luncheon following. So if you're able to make it, um, that would be wonderful. It's during the week, during the middle of the day. So it's a little trickier, but um, it will be, I think, a lovely, a lovely opportunity to give thanks for her. If you have cards, I don't have the family's address there. You know, she had four sons, but you're welcome to bring cards here. I will bring them to them, and I will also get an address that you can send cards directly if you would like to, to one of the sons. So that is this coming Wednesday. Second of all, I received an email from Clayton. Lavon has been at Martin Luther Manor going through uh, rehabilitation to gain strength. Uh, she was transferred from there back to Fairview Southdale Hospital. She had some bleeding in her, uh, she had some bleeding, they found some bleeding and they repaired it, but now she is back at the hospital waiting to go back to Martin Luther Manor. But of course, because this is the holiday weekend, things are always up in the air. So hopefully she'll be back to Martin Luther soon, but it may not be until after Memorial Day. So continue to keep them in your prayers as uh, there's a lot of health issues that they're concerned about. Lastly, I would ask prayers for my parents. Wednesday night, late, my mom took my dad to the ER and he was having a heart attack. So they transferred him to St. Mary's um, in the middle of the night. And that day, Thursday, he ended up having two stints put in um, and uh, is now on the mend. He got back home yesterday afternoon. Um, but it was also discovered that his oxygen levels go fairly low during the evening. And so he's recovering from the heart stuff, but now there's other, other issues that they're needing to address. So uh, prayers for healing and discernment for them. It was, a, it was an intense few days. Are there any other joys or concerns this day? If not, then I invite us to a moment of silent prayer. Holy and loving God, we give thanks to you for hearing all our prayers, the ones that we share aloud with one another and the ones that we whisper only in the quiet of our hearts. We give thanks that you know all our worries and fears, all our uncertainties, all our anxieties. We give thanks that we can lift them up to you and that you carry them with and for us. This day we especially lift up to those whom we've named. We lift up to you, Clayton and Levon, who are going back and forth with medical care with Levon. Grant them strength and wisdom for the decisions that need to be made. Grant them healing so that Levon might return not only to Martin Luther, but back with Clayton. Help Clayton find rest, knowing that his beloved is being cared for. Surround them 
and walk close with them in the days and weeks and months that lie ahead. I also lift up my mom and dad who are still recovering from the shock of everything that comes with a heart attack and surgery and clinics and doctors and hospitals. Be with them as they heal. Be with them as they go about next decisions and tests. Help them know that they go not alone. We also lift up to you Betty's children and family as we all gather to offer our thanks for her life and all that she will always be to those who knew and loved her and as we bless her on the way. Be with those who are traveling from afar, bring them safely together. Help us to honor her and honor you with our words as we gather on Wednesday. Holy God, we also remember that this is Memorial Day weekend, not only a time for barbecues and summer plans and all of those rituals, but a time to remember and give thanks for those who gave their lives in the service of this country. Though their names may fade, may we never forget. May we always be thankful for the many freedoms we have and may we use those freedoms not in self-service, but in service to one another. We lift up to you and name in our hearts all of those who are in need of, of companionship, in need of a safe place in which to live, or food on the table, all those who are struggling just to get through the day, all of those who struggle with mental illness or physical challenges or loneliness. We remember all of those in our nation and especially all of those in the world who are living with the reality of war and loss and destruction and devastation. Help us to continue to be people of hope even when it seems hope is such a far off reach. Holy God, we give thanks for the witness of those who came before us, the witness of Jesus in their midst so that we too might believe that there is more than what this world shows us. There is more that goes on than we can see with our own eyes. That you work for good for all of those who love you. That hope and love and life are greater than death and sin. We give thanks, O oh God, for the many blessings in our lives. Help us to lift them up each and every day. Blessings of food, shelter, blessings of travel, blessing of gathering with friends and family, even when it's for a memorial service. Help us to be grateful that we can gather together. Thank you for this church and for its ministry and mission as we seek to be faithful to Jesus the Christ. Hear all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught all who would follow him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So I invite you to stand as able as together we join our voices in the closing hymn, Standing on the Promises.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and grant you peace this day and forevermore. And may all God's people say, Amen. Amen.